As usual, we really want to thank uh, St. Anne for hosting us and Father Joseph Parahubka, our new uh, priest in town, uh, new to us anyway in our programs. Thanks a lot. And also uh, thanks to our sound men, Joe Brown, and his associate, Mark Hanley, for being here today. And of course, always a special thanks to MCAT. Um, as always, this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Te Television as part of a media assistance grant donated to the Bonner Milltown History Center by MCAT. And you can find um, past roundtables on their website on demand at channel 189 at www.mcat.org and look for the on demand link. So. Um, there's a program on the ba uh, calendar on the back of your program, if you want to flip that over. Um, the community confab that is tomorrow night is for all interested people to gather to explore ways that the Hellgate Lions Park can become more, more useful to residents as a community center. Um, there's new trustee management at the park, and so we're looking to um, do anything that we Maybe no changes are needed, but if there are some, we'd like to know about it. Um, I have to think about that one. <laughs> oh, you mean you want to shovel snow for us? That would be cool. Um, also, um, we have the open mic night at the barn at Hellgate Lions Park, which is on Tuesday night, and Kim is going to tell you more about that. It's got something new we're going to try for a roundtable wrap-up. Our next roundtable is a month in a month, April 15th at 2 o'clock, and it's going to be on the progression of gardening in Bonner from World War I to the present. And of course, we always invite you to come into the History Center on Tuesday morning. Jimmy Willis is the host, and he makes coffee and homemade cookies uh, starting 9 or 9.30 until the last person is ready to go home. And Wednesdays and Thursdays were open from 2 to 4.30. And of course, remember, the pasty dinner follows today's program. A full meal is $7. A takeout pasties are $5 each. So are there any other announcements from the audience that I should bring forward? OK, um, we'll move into the introduction of the program. Kim Brighamans is our host for the program today, and his family moved to the Marshall Grade area in the 1950s. And Kim grew up in a house that bordered the Mullen Road, which sparked his lifelong interest in Montana history. Kim has been really active in all kinds of history projects in the Bonner area, including uh, the Centennial book, uh, History of St. Anne Catholic Church, when they had their centennial here. He worked on the reprint of a grassroots tribute, The Story of Bonner, Montana, which is our uh, bicentennial project that was reprinted a few years ago. And he also um, actually found the collection of 1,600 photographs in the janitor's room at Bonner School and took them home and cataloged and described all of them. And that is now known as the Jack L. Demons Historic Photo Collection. Um, Kim also collected writings about Bonner and the Blackfoot just um, for his own interests, and he collected them into an, an anthology that he called the Bonner Bootleg, and he'll explain that to you. Uh, and it's the Bonner Bootleg that it serves as the inspiration for today's program. Thank, thank you, Judy. Um, 
We are going to try a little different format for this roundtable today. It consists of a, um, a number of readings from the past of Bonner. And a couple reasons that we're going to do this program, I guess, this particular program. Um, like most of you here, or many of you here, I grew up in Bonner, and actually West Bonner on the Marshall Grade, Marshall Canyon area. And um, I, I could tell stories until the cows came home, if anybody would listen to them, about, about those years. As I, as I grew older and had kids of my own at Bonner School, um, I began to recognize and realize that so many other um, people had written and published high quality stuff about Bonner um, over the years, dating back to Meriwether Lewis in 1806. And, um, and then if you expand that scope to the Blackfoot and the Norman McLeans and the Onyx Smiths of the world, we have uh, high class, first class, maybe world class uh, literary background here in Bonner. It, um, I, I guess I'd say that it, combined with the, my own experiences, it, it enhanced um, my feelings, my affection for Bonner, and uh, I did collect them, uh, began collecting what, some of them into a book years and years ago that I called Bonner Bootleg. Bootleg because I had no permi nobody's permission to put them in there but it didn't matter because it never got published. Um, but um, a lot of, not all of them, but several of the readings that we're going to have today um, are, are from the Bonner bootleg. The second reason really is maybe the most important one. We, we wanted to showcase the people behind the scenes that are putting these programs on and um, doing such great work down at the post office building at the History Center. This has been a more than a 10 year endeavor now. And um, most of the people you'll hear from have been involved in collecting and memori memorializing and uh, interpreting the stories of Bonner. And this is a good chance for them to, I guess, um, express their, their affection for the same thing. With that, I'd like the readers to stand up, if you would, <laughs> and I, I, I'm going to introduce everybody um, before the readings begin. And so once we start, once we st get into the program, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll roll right along, hopefully. Um, if you guys could face the audience. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, most, of, most of you know most of these guys, but uh, I found it interesting to a little, learn a little bit more about them. I'm going to start with uh, Norm Jacobson. Norman, we want wave to the crowd? <laughs> um, I'm going in alphabetical order. That's why I'm starting with him. Norm's a retired science teacher from Hellgate High School. He, uh, he lived in this area in West Bonner um, for more than 40 years. Um, that's, he, sa he says that sounds like a long time, but he feels in this crowd he, like a relative newcomer. After retirement, he became involved with the Traveler's Rest at Lolo, and during the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, became heavily involved as a, as a very knowledgeable docent volunteer out at Traveler's Rest. Among the many endeavors that he, um, he has done and is still doing, uh, is tracing, photographing, and leading tours of much of Meriwether Lewis's path along the road to the Buffalo um, up the Blackfoot. And so um, he, uh, he will be reading from Meriwether Lewis today. Next we have, next to Norman is Bob Lamley. And uh, Bob is um, a longtime Forester was a longtime forester for Anaconda and Champion out here at Bonner and other places. 
Um, born in Ohio, he attended Ohio State University and came out west in 1949 to attend forestry school here at the University of Montana. Um, walked onto the football team, played on the line three years for the Grizzlies. Um, graduated in 52 and went to work um, for as a forester for the Anaconda Company. Um, his first years were on the Thompson River. He retired from Champion in 1992 after nearly 40 years. Um, when, he when he retired, he was the general manager of Champion's, uh, all of Champion Timberlands in Montana, all 870,000 acres of it. Um, so he is uh, providing our insights uh, into the history of the forest management since 1953. Next is Judy Matson. Um, well, I could go on and on here, but um, Judy's the founder, a founder, and co-director now of the Montana or of the Bonner Milltown History Center. I think most of us regard her as our tireless leader um, in so many areas. She and Gary moved. Gary's our esteemed projectionist. Where is he? There he is. <laughs> She and Gary moved to Missoula in 1966 and then um, out here to West Riverside in the next year and put down roots. Um, the, she is a founding, Judy's a founding member of the 2003 Milltown Reservoir Superfund site working group and chaired the History and Culture Committee, which basically led to what we're what we know now as the Bonner Milltown History Center. Um, she actually led the project to digitize the 1600 photos of the Demons collection um, at the, with the University of Montana that's now available of Montana Memory Project and you can get online and find those photos um, um, just on your computer. Print them out if you want. Um, she also served on the committee to reprint the Bonner History Book, a grassroots tribute, the story of Bonner, Montana. In 2009, Judy was awarded the Missoula Historic Preservation Commission's Dorothy Ogg Award for Historic Preservation. Um, and last year, Judy and Gary both were awarded the Lieutenant Moss Award by, for Outstanding Service by the Historical Museum of Fort Missoula. Next in line, we have Dennis Sane at the far end here. Dennis, born in Missoula, grew up in the Rattlesnake Valley. He went to school at St. Xavier Grade School and graduated from Missoula County High School in 1958. Doesn't look that old, does he? <laughs> Started work in the night shift at ACM in Bonner in 1960, mostly on the river, sending logs from the log pond to the debarker. Started in the woods in 1962 and remained there for 30 years through the ACM and Champion years, running heavy equipment, mostly the road grader. He joined the History Center in its first year, preserving the, with an interest of preserving the lumber and logging history of the Bonner Mills. Um, among the things he's done is he created three to scale award winning dioramas of logging equipment for the History Center. Next we have Glenn Smith. Glenn, Max, Hooligan, Smith, take your pick. <laughs> um, Glenn moved, was a, age seven when he moved to Bonner in 1950. And he grew up here, went to school here, started working at the sawmill in 60, um, worked for Anaconda, Champion, and Stimson. 41-year career here. Um, while with Champion, he was the historian for their newsletter, The Tamarack. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and here, he's done amazing work um, for the History Center, including compiling an atlas of the Bonner houses to supplement the Bonner Company Town National Historic nomination. Um, if you've been in River City Grill, Glenn prepared an atlas for all the historic photos that are on the uh, on the walls at the River City Grill. You pick up the, the loose leaf notebook at the front desk and you can take yourself through that, that whole, t whole tour. 
And finally, we have Rick Swanson. Rick uh, actually was born in Sweden, but he grew up in Milltown, spent his 34-year career working at the Bonner Mill, um, whether I Anaconda champion and was there some time with Stimson, Rick? No, no. In fact, he, you were the last man out for champion, right? <laughs> Rick and the boss. <laughs> Um, he, he worked with the sawmill, the planer, the small log mill, dry chain, and in the yard. In his um, last years, he worked in the warehouse until until Champion sold. So those are our readers today. Uh, I'd like to recognize a couple of others um, who are with us. These are the, the truly courageous members of the History Center. They had the guts to say no. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to get up there and read. Um, Jim Jim Willis is holds down the fort on Tuesday mornings at the History Center. Um, lifelong Milltown resident, Milltown, Piltsville now. Um, Forty three and a half years, I think, in, for Anaconda and Champion. Um, Miney Smith is a co-director with Judy. Um, she was going to be a reader last month before we got snowed out. Um, and since then, her and Alan have taken their annual sojourn to the to uh, England, yeah, and uh, she can't be with us today. Uh, is Lee here? Lee Legrid? Uh, Lee, no, no Lee, nor um, Willie. But Andy, Andy Luke's another um, regular contributor to our <laughs> to our program. Retired forester for the Forest Service, the Peace Corps, and the state of Montana. He was hired by Champion International as planning manager in charge of long-range planning um, and became a district forester. Retired from Stimson in 2005. So those are our presenters. These are, the, these are the people who have really dedicated a lot of their time, mostly in their retirement years, but um, to tell the story, to keep the story, to interpret the story of Bonner, and um, to keep the story alive. <laughs> Please be seated. <laughs> or as our priest said this morning, sit down. <laughs> um, when... Richard Hugo first came to Missoula to teach in the English department at the at the university. Um, he had he he and his first wife couldn't get into their the rental home in the university district in Missoula, so they stayed short for a short time in an apartment building at in, in Milltown. And the first person he met and the first place he went there apparently was. Harold Herndon and the Milltown Union Club that came to be known as Harold's Club. And for the next, uh, well, until he died, basically, that was his home away from home. He wrote uh, a number of poems in his career um, about um, Bonner and about the Milltown Union Bar, including one that was the, called the Milltown Union Bar, Laundromat and Café. He started it off, you could love here. And later he said, you were nothing going in and now you kiss your hand. Another poem he wrote was where Jenny used to swim. It was for Jenny Herndon, Jenny McDonald Herndon, um, probably based on stories of her childhood here. He said, he wrote, the Blackfoot bends, pools deep around the cliff that bends it, and a brave man arcs down yelling, hey, Another poem he wrote was To Die in Milltown. He wrote it for Gene Jarvis. Is to die in Milltown is to have an old but firmly painted name and friends. The Blackfoot, any river, has a million years to lend and weather's always wild to look at down the Hillgate. Barely a week after he died of cancer in October of 1982, um, his poem Richard Hugo's poem, Making Certain It Goes On, was um, 
was first published in the American Poetry Review. That was in the November-December issue of, of that. As far as I can tell, that was the first time it, it was published. An anthology of his writings called Making Certain It Goes On was published after his death, a couple years after his death. The title poem is, is longer than most um, of his, so I'm not going to read it all uh, at once, at least. But here's how it starts. At last, the big Blackfoot River has risen high enough to again cover the stones, dry too many months. Trout return from summer harbor deep in the waters of the Power Company Dam. High on the bank, where he knows the river won't reach, the drunk fisherman tries to focus on a possible strike and tries to ignore the hymn coming from the white frame church. The stone he leans against, bleached out dull gray, underwater looked beautiful and blue. The young minister had hoped for a better parish, say one with bells that sound gold, and a congregation that doesn't stop coming when the mill shuts down. Uh, <clears throat> this has been a pretty exciting time to be living here in the Bonner Valley. A lot of history has been made in this valley uh, that is very, very important, and our history will continue uh, to be important for a very long time. Uh, Lewis was the first person to record in writing anything about the Bonner area uh, and the north end of Missoula uh, Valley for that matter. On July 3rd in 1806, Lewis uh, tra uh, left Traveler's Rest uh, with nine men from the expedition, uh, five natives, and 17 horses. Uh, they headed for the falls of the Missouri uh, by the way of the road to the Buffalo. Uh, Lewis just about drowned crossing the Clark Fork River uh, in a quickly constructed raft uh, down below the confluence with uh, uh, Clark Fork. Uh, then the, <coughs> the next day, they proceeded up uh, through the Hellgate uh, Canyon uh, into our valley here at Bonner. Oh. Uh, Lewis stayed uh, on the north side of the Blackfoot River just across from the mill over here, uh, as I'm sure he didn't want to get wet again. Uh, though he finally did cross the Blackfoot River up uh, past Clearwater Junction on the 5th. Uh, and I'm <clears throat> going to read some of the words that Lewis wrote uh, while he was in the Bonner area. Uh, and this uh, comes from the uh, journals of Lewis and Clark expedition that was written by uh, Gary Moulton. Uh, five miles of our route was through a part of an extensive valley in which we were encamped. We then entered the mountains with the east fork of the Clark Fork River. The narrow confined pass on its north side, which is Hellgate Canyon, and continuing up that river uh, five miles uh, to the entrance of Kokolish Kit, Kit, I think that's the way it goes, <laughs> uh, which falls into the northeast side, uh, is about 60 yards wide, deep and rapid. The banks are bold, not very high, but they never overflow. Uh, the East Fork below its junction with this stream is 100 yards wide and above it, it's about 90. Uh, the water of both are turbid, uh, but the east branch much most too. Uh, their beds are composed of sand and gravel. Uh, the East Fork uh, possesses a large portion of the former. Neither of those streams are navigable in consequences of the rapids and the shoals which obstruct the currents. Uh, thus far, a plain, untimbered, 
bordered river, which nears the junction of these streams, spread into a handsome valley plain. No great extent, the hills are covered with leaf pines and fir. I now continue my route up the north side of the Kokolishkit River uh, through a timbered country for eight miles and then encamped in a handsome bottom on the river where there was an abundance of grass uh, for our horses. The evening was fine, the air pleasant, and most of all, no mosquitoes. Uh, a few miles before we encamped, I killed a squirrel of species common to the Rocky Mountains and a ground squirrel of a species I have not seen before. I preserved the skins of both of these animals. John Toole. John Toole is uh, Don H. Toole was great grandfather. Cornelius O'Keefe came to Montana with Captain John Mullins' road building crew in 1859. His grandfather, Kenneth Ross, a logger, became boss of the Anaconda Mill in in uh, Bonner. John Toole H was born in Missoula 1918. He joined the BFPA which is the Blackfoot Forest Protective Association which was located in the Bonner Hall on the north end of Bonner. Les Talbert was the boss of the BFPA an association funded by the landowners of Timberlands, with Anaconda being the largest landholder. And this reading that I'm going to have is, was taken from John Toole's The Baron, The Logger, and The Miner, and Me. July brought hot weather and sultry nights, and the skies lit up in brilliant, eerie flashes, with thunder rolling off in the distance like the boom of huge guns. Tom Harper, our boss at Bonner, said, All hell's going to break loose tonight at any time. Don't leave the building. In the middle of one night, Frank Inman wakened me by shaking my shoulder. Get up, Johnny. There's a fire at Potomac. I staggered out and jumped into a pickup. Frank drove east up the river over the gravel road to Potomac. When we broke out into the Potomac Valley, the fire was in full view. It was nothing but a brightly burning blaze in the top of a big ponderosa pine that had been struck by lightning. This'll be easy, Frank said. The pine was not far off the road as we gathered up a saw and two axes. Frank said, now kid, we've got to cut that pine and the top might come down any minute. While you're working, keep your eye cocked over your head so you won't get conked. As we eased the saw into the wood, flaming branches kept coming down and we hopped here and there to avoid them. No hard hats in those days. We made our undercut, then moved back of the tree. Our saw was sharp, and pretty soon Frank hollered, Timber! The pine came crashing down, and the top scattered burning wood all over the forest. Get on them little blazes quick, kid, Frank shouted, and we attacked the small fires with shovel and Pulaski's, which is a fire tool with an axe on one blade and the hoe on the other. And this was developed by the Forest Service by a man named Pulaski. We had everything smothered in short order. Then we went down to the creek, got 80 gallons of water and put it out good. I said expansively and authoritatively, well, that wasn't much. Frank said, kid, 
you talk like you knew all about firefighting. Fact is, you know nothing. A few nights later, our dispatcher, Frank Schaefer, answered the phone. He turned to us and said, A lady in Missoula says there's a fire burning on top of University Mountain. This mountain is the big hump behind Mount Sentinel, just back of the University of Montana. It is brutally steep, rising over 2,000 feet from the valley floor. Tom Harper said he was too old and tried to make that and too tired to make that climb and told me to take a couple of men up, put out the fire. It was long before the days of smoke jumpers, but we were young and we raced down the streets of Bonner, crossed the Milwaukee Railroad Bridge, and went up on a beeline to the top. We pawed the trees apart, slipped on the big clumps of grass, after two hours clawed our way to the clearing on the mountain top. We couldn't believe what we saw. There was a huge steel tower on top of the mountain, and on top of it was a brilliant white and red light slowly revolving. One boy says, I'll be damned, what the heck is that? I watched the tower for a while, then it suddenly came to me. Say, I know what it is. It's the beacon to glide planes. What the heck are you talking about, he said. I said, call up the airport and ask him. Frank made the call, then turned to me. By golly, you're right. They just installed it yesterday. What's this world coming to? Think of the cost of that light and all the taxpayer's expense. The rest of us were all mad about the wild goose chase and plum wore out. We slept the rest of the day. Well, my name's Bob Lamley, and Judy assigned me the job of talking about Dan Cushman and the Timberjack. And Dan Cushman was a Montana author and published The Timberjack in 1953. The best, best known novel was Stay Away Joe, which was published. And from that, I'd like to go in and talk about his novel, Dan Cushman, from the Timber, Timberjack in 1953, Surveying the Chattico. It snowed during the night, wet, wet and heavy snow that sagged their little tent and gave forth the dampness of it penetrating everything. Their boots were still damp and cold and a long jog in the gray cloud morning to get wood burning and to cook breakfast. They went on. That was the wild country untouched by the ax as they traveled. The sun came up, melting the snow except for shaded places high along the ridge. They crossed a granite knob and doubled back to strike the Chelico along the western limits. It was a magnificent timber growing with scarcely any underbrush. The huge trunks were rising straight as pillars in the Greek temple. The trees rose from a brace and roots broader than a man's outflung arms, tapering the trunks as they grew without a branch or even with heights before the green tops were spread towards the sky. He left Holloman behind. He walked by himself through the forest, and there the soft underfoot accumulation of centuries stillness was remarkable. High, high overhead, you could see the sky and the forest from the primy old times. A quality that always only existed always would. It was like being along the vast cathedral and make him feel lonely and insignificant in what was disquieting feelings and joy. That was why he had left the kid behind. He liked Holloman, but he talked too much. On the 
forced was seldom any need for a man to say anything. He, he, he got to thinking about timbering and tracks, destroying the cathedral, but he thought a little smile and did not like the thought. The better judgment told him that the forest was mature and there was no further growth in it, and it was no destruction in taking out great trees that will reach the old age and letting young ones drive in. <clears throat> you know, it kind of reminds me of my beginning of my career. I started in the Thompson River. That's a drainage uh, between Plains and Thompson Falls. And it was largely a, a drainage untouched by the logging. It, it went from Thompson Falls, which goes into the Clark's Fork River, and it went curved up to Highway two up at above um, well the, the main Toms River drainage and then it, w it went on into an area called Lost Prairie and Pleasant Valley and it was something like what he described that Lost Prairie and Pleasant Valley had big large trees no undergrowth to speak of and a lot of it was owned by the Anaconda Company a lot of it was actually owned by some of the ranchers that lived there so it was really interesting hearing tell that story and think about my first years as a forester working in the Thompson River building the road. We started in Thompson Falls and ended up in a little town called Marion, which was almost 70 miles. But it up went through some real beautiful timber stands, some of the best in Montana. So with that, I'd like to conclude and say that it was really nice to be able to work with the Anaconda Company and Champion and work in these timberlands as a forester myself. And to look back at all those beautiful trees and like you said, they were mature and they were gonna die and so a lot of them were harvested. And they, what you saw those big logs coming on railroad cars to Bonner that's where they were coming from, the Thompson River. Sorry. Okay, guess what? <laughs> no laughing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a, a little deal here on Abel Mattia. Do you remember Abel Mattia? How's that? Better? Sounds better. Okay. He was a local kid, born here in Milltown on April 18, 1950. Attended the University of Montana. Moved to California at the age of 23 and wrote a story about his childhood in the Bonner Milltown area. In this story, which appeared in a 1979 issue of Reader's Digest, and I had an opportunity of reading that, and it is a great story. It reminds me so much of my childhood out here when I was known as the hooligan. Two of my best friends are sitting back here. Most of the shenanigans that we pulled, those guys somehow had their thumb in that pie. So it was a great time. And Emil, he come along a little bit before I did. I can combine into uh, Bonner until the 1950s. Okay, this is a nonfiction story. So I'll get my stuff organized here and we'll get started. Okay, as Emil stated, it was 20 below with a Montana blizzard snarling out of the Blackfoot Canyon. Twilight Little Milltown was already snug down for the night after its frugal wartime dinner. The only human movement was an angular girlish form moving between snowbanks, clutching her coat around her chin. Hazel, our Milltown librarian. Seven o'clock Tuesday night and blizzard or no blizzard, there would be those who would want books, need books, to hold back the grinding fear for their loved ones overseas. It was 1918, and for Milltown mothers and wives, 
There was no radio to bring news. There's no television to bring news. Just the cutting cold and banked up fires, oil lamps, and hearth fires. And Hazel's books, twice every week, her village customers came to the attic room over the bakery. Every Tuesday evening at 7, every Saturday afternoon at 2. They counted on her. How could she let them down? Hazel kept her coat on and blew on her fingers while she lifted the nickel ornamented lid off the corner stove, started a fire. She'd used kindling, she chopped herself with a big blunt kitchen knife. I've been chased with one of them when I mouth off to my wife once in a while. Then, <laughs> she opened up the somber bookcases after she got that fire going and opened uh, those bookcases along the wall and against the walls to display all that wealth of thought and silent action. All the treasures of the world, courtesy of Hazel. It had started only a year before in 1917. Hazel Beetle was just 18 and still in high school when she startled Missoula County Library officials by gravely demanding that her sawmill hamlet, seven miles from the county seat, be given a library. Not a big one, just to start a few books. No money, they frowned. Didn't she know there was a war on? Couldn't the Milltown folk come to Missoula for their books? That is, if that handful of immigrant sawmill workers really wanted books. Hazel's dark eyes flashed behind her thick horn-rimmed glasses, her fins, Norwegians and Swedes, and French Canadians. Might be uneducated, but yes, they did want books. It was a hard, rough seven miles to Missoula, and the winters were often snowed in. Books would give them something to dream on, so they could forget the sawmill drudgery and the Kaiser. Hazel got her books, but everything else, housing, service, was left up to her. That was the deal. Take it or leave it. The Milltown Branch Library, which was the first of its kind in the entire state, began in 1917 with a small collection in the house of a local teacher. When the teacher moved away the very next year, Hazel's bookcases were carted up to the bakery attic. But then, the baker decided he needed that attic room. Sorry, Hazel. There were no more than 10 to 12 functioning business establishments at this little crossroads on the highway. Hazel knocked on every door. It looked hopeless. Finally, as a last resort, she marched into the restaurant. The customers looked up as the awkward, lath thin girl with bun black hair said to the proprietor, Yelmer, a big blue-eyed, white-bearded Finn, you got two empty rooms upstairs. I need them. You, Hazel, what in Perkelly for? Anybody know what Perkelly means? What the devil for? Okay, Hazel's thin lips tightened for our library. I need those rooms, Yelmer. She got the rooms. She scrubbed them down with strong soap. Her Scottish ancestors might have recognized the stubbornness. This was Hazel's dream. It must not die. It was in 1920 that back by a handful of rugged Scandinavian housewives and their squirming husbands, I can identify with that, Hazel marched into the August offices of the Northern Pacific Railroad Company then the Western Lumber Company, then the Anaconda Copper Mining Company itself. Boy, she's big time now. Okay, it was time to give the Milltown Branch Library a permanent home of its own. These three companies for the town's existence. It was their duty to keep their employees' brains active as well as their hands and feet. She got her way. It wasn't easy to say no to Hazel when those solemn brown eyes had you pinned to the wall. The new library was a solid frame building with a wide inviting porch set back a ways from the bustling 
post-war highway. It was a monument to Hazel's dreams, and a relief from the sometimes rankest noise of Yalmer's restaurant downstairs. Okay, I was five when I first went to the library, peeked over the wide desk with the neat card file boxes and date stampers on it, and I saw Hazel. She was tall, bony, very severe. Those heavy black rimmed glasses perched on her nose looked down at me awesomely. And if she had a smile just when she did, I would have scampered out and never came back. <laughs> Reminds me of our third grade teacher. <laughs> Lazy Saturday afternoons in August when other kids were fishing up Deer Creek or swimming by the covered bridge, I would steal in amongst the many book smells. They were musty. Outside, the bees were buzzing in the hollyhocks that Hazel had planted by the windows. Idling amongst the bookshelves, I let my fingers just touch them with pleasure. Sometimes Hazel would come and gently remove pride and pleasure from my ten-year-old hands and replace it with Treasure Island. <laughs> I wanted to be a writer, and I didn't dare tell. Hazel about it, but I think she guessed and pointed the way. She saved out books that were special just for me. Of course, Hazel had to work, and of course, she became a school teacher. She was my third grade school teacher and my favorite. I remember sloshing home with Emily Halva, whose books I carried through the spring snow melt and having Emily burst into tears because she had graduated to the fourth grade. She wanted to stay with Miss Beetle. So did I. Hazel married the town butcher, young Anal Karkinen, was a handsome, muscular man who liked fishing and hunting. He was quite a catch, and there were those who sighed and wondered why he had married this plain grave-eyed librarian who used no rouge. I knew why. Hazel had a beauty and a character she didn't need to advertise. It was just there. Years went by, winters and summers, depression, war. Still Hazel never missed a Tuesday evening or Saturday afternoon. <coughs> it was a rock to cling to in a world of frightening changes. Anil Karkin had died one bleak March night. For a few weeks, Hazel never left that big frame house by the butcher shop with a closed sign on it. Then one Tuesday night, the library was open again. Hazel's hair was streaked with gray, and she walked a little more slowly, but she was back with us. In a world where books don't seem to be the treasure they once were, and people are by and large too busy to do something for somebody else. We need to take the time to say thanks Hazel for all you did. So during this time I had a chance to talk to Jim Willis and Rick Swanson and I got to know Hazel and the buildings and stuff that's mentioned here and they're real interesting if you want to take that walk through Milltown and see it. I also had a chance to sit in the home of Bill and Jean Walker and drink a cup of coffee in that very house she lived in. So I was uh, pretty proud to say that, and I'm tickled that I took Judy's advice to do this story because what an experience. This took me back to a time that I had completely forgotten about. So anyway, that's my story about Hazel. I will come back and I'll bend your ear again with a poem that will happen a little bit later. Okay. They were. Thanks, Dennis. Dennis Dillman, and they were. Yeah. We had... Uh, yeah, we had one of their relatives live out here, and I think this gentleman, I don't bear him no ill will, but 
we focused our attention on pulling shenanigans on him. He was an authoritative person, kind of like Barney Fife on the Andy Griffith Show. And it was glorious fun to twist his tail up in a knot. Eventually, though, he did get even with me. He told me that there's a job waiting down on Bonner Green Chain in the sawmill. And I went to work down there, and that's as close to dying as I ever came in my life. So he got even with me. Okay. Well, I have a reminiscence called Bonner Remembered by Georgina Fenwick, and this comes from the Grassroots Tribute, A Story of Bonner, Montana. When the Bonner School staff was putting together the Grassroots History Book for the 1976 Bicentennial, they were able to reach out to Georgina Fenwick of San Francisco, who, as an eight-year-old, attended Bonner School in its first year in 1889. She was the eight-year-old daughter of George and Mary Fenwick, and Mary Fenwick was the sister of the Hammond brothers, A.B., George, Henry, and Fred, all of whom had roles in Missoula, Bonner, and the surrounding mills in the 1880s. Georgina wrote this remembrance of Bonner and sent it to the Bicentennial Committee shortly before her death in San Francisco in February of 1976. Bonner remembered. I was eight in 1889 when I moved from Helena to Bonner with my parents and my younger sister and brother, both who were too young to go to school. Margaret Robinson was my first teacher. The schoolroom was upstairs in the Masonic building. We sat on benches in front of desks for four, peop for four pupils. In one corner, a wood stove heated the room in winter, and in the opposite corner was a pail of drinking water and a tin dipper. The pupils were the usual mixture found in a mill town of that era. French Canadians, Scandinavians, Canadians, and Midwest Americans. In the old school registers are their names, Cormier, Nearman, Lebeau, Lapointe, Manville, Sailor, Newport, Clinic, Graham, Fenwick. I remember about 25 pupils in that room, and Miss Robinson taught all eight grades. There were several big boys and girls who could have created problems for a less experienced teacher, but she was a firm disciplinarian, maintaining order with great skill and good humor and she was very pretty. There were blackboards and shelves for books and a table on a raised platform where the teacher sat. Children came to the front of the room to recite their lessons when their names were called. Few pupils went beyond the eighth grade. Some would drop out before the great event of graduation. Recess was the highlight of our day, except for lunchtime. When the weather was nice, we played run, sheep, run, prisoner's base, kick the can, and unsophisticated baseball. In the winter, the deep snow was all around, but we had our sleds for racing down the hill behind the school. We skied on barrel staves and had many a snow fight. Our first home in Bonner was a house next to the company store and office. My sister Anne was born there. Later, in the early 90s, we moved to the Hotel Margaret, named for Margaret Robinson, which was built to accommodate visitors and to provide a home for the office store, office force. The square in front of the hotel where men came in from the evening to draw drinking water from the well was made into a park. In the old register of the Hotel Margaret, one could find the names of many great Montana people who spent time in Bonner. My uncle, Andrew B. Hammond, president of Missoula and Bonner operations, often brought friends and business associates to Bonner. I remember Daniel E. Bandman, a retired actor who lived on a ranch near Missoula. He gave dramatic readings from Shakespeare. We had quarters in one wing of the hotel. My other uncle, Henry Hammond, and Miss Robinson had their meals with us. Uncle Henry was rather stern and a bachelor. We children were somewhat in awe of him, so behaved properly when he was around. Our cousins from Missoula, of which there were many, both grown-ups and children often came to visit us. I remember how welcome they were and how we enjoyed these family gatherings and holiday visits. When I was 12, I was given a bicycle. It was the joy of my life. Freedom was mine. 
I would ride to the station to see the trains come and go. I whirled off to my music lessons given by the station master's wife. She was a musician who had come west in answer to an advertisement for a wife. Highly romantic saga to a child of 12. There was a radiance to living for children growing up in Bonner all those years ago. We were not, until long afterward, aware of the hardships our parents endured. Children, as I remember, felt secure, enjoyed people and places, loved what they saw and did. It was a free and happy life for children, skating in the winter on the river, climbing the mountains back of Bonner in the summer, picking wildflowers, chokeberries, and elderberries, picnicking in fields by the rushing steams, streams born of the snowpack. I am glad I lived for a while in Bonner. The radiance of that freedom remains with me. We love to imagine, Richard Hugo wrote, a giant bull trout or a lunker rainbow will grab the drunk fisherman's bait and shock the drunk fisherman out of his recurrent afternoon dream and into the world of real sky and real water. We love to imagine the drought is ended, the high water will stay, the excess irrigate crops, the mill reopen, the workers go back to work, lovers reassume plans to be married. One lover, also the son of the drunk fisherman, by now asleep on the bank for no trout worth imagining has come, will not invite his father to the happy occasion, though his father will show up sober and properly dressed, and the son will no longer be sure of the source of the shame he has always rehearsed. We're gonna try something dangerous an intermission because this is longer than a usual program we're going to take 10 minutes now and help yourself to cookies the bathroom or if you have something you want to talk about the dangerous part is getting everybody back together in 10 minutes and I think we have some signals uh, two-minute warnings that you can listen for when the music starts or the train whistle blows, I'm not sure. So I've got 3.02 right now. We'll, uh, we'll resume at 3.12, if that's okay. Well, that worked pretty good. I appreciate it. Um, we're gonna try something, as Judy mentioned before. On Tuesday night at the Hellgate Lions Park Barn, we're gonna kind of resume what we're doing today with a lot less um, structure to it. So we're inviting people who have, anybody who has um, a writing or knows of a writing about Bonner and the Blackfoot to come and just sit around the table and exchange stories, exchange poems, exchange, if you, if you have an art piece you wanna talk about, um, just a very loosely structured thing, if you got, music got a song to sing got a dance I don't know it, it, it can go any direction we want and it probably will because we're inviting uh, in to bring your own beverage <laughs> and I'm just gonna bring a six-pack but um, anything goes and uh, it I think we're gonna start it at seven seven o'clock and Hellgate Lions Park Barn is at the end of First Street, uh, up against the mountain uh, in West Riverside. Um, if you know somebody that might want to come along, might, might want to join in, um, it, it could be fun. And it could lead to something we do regularly after these roundtables as a follow-up thing, because there's so many things we want to talk about <laughs> that we don't have time for. Jim. I've been, uh, as you well know, I've been paging through the uh, Daily Missoulians from the decade of the 30s, the 40s, and now I'm into 1951. I have to ask Kim whether uh, stories about Bonner, the bridges, the railroads, stuff like that, 
can be presented because I don't know if those newspaper coverages are ac historically accurate. We don't care. <laughs> we want stories, Jim. Not not all of the stories we're telling today are historically accurate. They're they're just good stories. I, I um, there are in the Bonner bootleg, for instance, there are the Missoulian articles um, about the mill from back in the 1920s and so on and so forth. So um, those are fair game. In fact, I might read part of one and so on and so forth. Um, just to keep it in mind, it's Tuesday night. There's already an activity, as Judy mentioned, in the barn tomorrow night. Um, and everybody, of course, is urged to come to that. But Tuesday night, we could have some fun. We will return. At, ter, I should mention, I can't remember if we mentioned the pasty dinner afterwards. Did we mention that? Okay. The St. Anne Parish is um, putting on pasties. There'll be many of them available for $5 or a full dinner with coleslaw and gravy for $7 and a drink. We return to Richard Hugo. Next summer, the, the river will recede. The stones bleach out to their dullest possible shade. The fishermen will slide bleary down the bank and trade in any chance he has of getting a strike for some old durable dream. A dream that will keep out the hymn coming again from the church. The workers will be back full shift. The power company will lower the water in the dam to make repairs, make repairs and raise rates. The drunk fisherman will wait for the day his son returns divorced and bitter and swearing revenge on what the old man has come to believe is only water rising and falling on climatic schedule. This next selection that I'm going to read is are written by is is a selection from her book, Onyx Smith. Onyx Smith homesteaded with her husband Dave and four sons on a ranch on Bear Creek in the Blackfoot Valley in the mid 1960s. She was born in Paris in 1936 and raised in Chicago. A writer, editor, and independent filmmaker, Smith produced the movie Heartland in 1979 and it became an award-winning movie. She was also a co-editor with her longtime partner, Bill Kittredge, of The Last Best Place, the Montana Anthology. And it was, in fact, Bill Kittredge who coined that phrase, The Last Best Place. Her sons, uh, Aunt, twins Alex and Andrew, went to Potomac School and are now grown and have produced several feature films of their own. This selection is excerpted from her 1995 book, Homestead, which was published by Milkweed Editions of Minneapolis, Minnesota. The river that runs through it. On summer evenings, I looked north from the deck outside my log kitchen and watched night crawl up the Bear Creek drainage from the blue-black valley of the Big Blackfoot. I cannot see the river or the creek from where I sit, but the humped mountains all around are scarred by clear cuts and slashed with logging roads. Owls cry. Ghosts of old forests rise in the dusky light. I imagine the deep woods as they were before Anaconda, before Champion and Plum Creek. A long-billed snipe dives from the clouds, wind sounding through his feathers and a trilling, whistling mating call. Some nights the northern sky pulses green, green waves and luminous stripes passing over the eaves of my shake roof. After fireworks one Fourth of July in our Wild West days of the 1970s, a bunch of good old boys and gals were passing the Jack Daniels around a fire burned down to coals. A visiting rider stood by the tailgate of his pickup, stoned on acid. He looked up to the sky, then at us. You seeing the same thing I am? I cannot fathom what my friend saw in his altered state, but the rest of us were craning our heads toward the light show on the Milky Way. We studied the northern lights with the fascination of Neanderthals gawking outside their caves. Remembering that night, I think of light flowing like a river. I think of blood and sap, the common, recurrent, fluid patterns of life. 
and now we're spending a morning fishing. There is an idyllic morning I carry around with me like a lucky rubbing stone. It is 1971, our first summer at the ranch, and Dave and I and our four boys have gone fishing on the big Blackfoot. We drive our sand-colored Land Rover to the edge of a high bank upstream from the mouth of Belmont Creek. Dave and the older boys scramble down to the rocky shore. It is cool in the morning shade of great branched ponderosas. The salmon fly hatch is about over, but a few of the heavy orange-bodied insects hang onto willow branches in the dewy air. When their wings dry, they will beat suicidally over riffles where lunker rainbows are waiting for breakfast. Use live ones for bait, shouts Dave, knee-deep in green water. Dave moves toward the head of the fishing hole. The boys and I hop through willows, service berry, and chokecherry brush. We snag the sluggish salmon fires. Within the hour, Dave hooks and nets two 20-inch rainbows. Eric and Steve, with their squiggling live flies, catch smaller trout. Even I get a good bite. The fishing is hot. And then it's over. I bring out tuna fish, sandwiches, peaches, and chocolate chip cookies, a thermos of coffee, a jar of lemonade. After lunch, when the, with the sun high and the water cool, I am happy to lie in the damp sand while the older guys go down river in search of elusive big ones. The four-year-old twins make dams out of colored river stones, aquamarine, rose, jade green. Norman McLean would soon memorialize these Precambrian rocks from the basement of time in the title story of A River Runs Through It. He would describe the big Blackfoot's deep patterns, the unity of a three-part fishing hole, the river's billion-year geologic history. McLean would connect the river and the act of fishing to a Presbyterian brand of theology and to the aesthetic of craft and art. He would articulate universal feelings of helplessness in the face of destiny and death. But on that faraway summer morning, I had no idea that my humanities professor from the University of Chicago just lived up the road at Seeley Lake. I did not know his wife had recently died or that he had retired from teaching. I never would have guessed that 20 miles upriver, at the age of 73, Norman McLean was beginning to write a great book about family and fishing and love, or that the book's culminating scene would take place exactly where I sat, daydreaming in the midway, in the midday Blackfoot breeze. And finally, on floating. Connecting with a river means learning to float. You think you know where you're going, and then you encounter an unexpected turn, a current, or flood. You are swept under. You emerge transformed by the act of surviving danger. The river hides rocks and deep snags and drowned creatures. And it is this secrecy that draws me, the tension between what's on the surface and what lies beneath. I believe we are more like rivers than we are like meadows. Floating on my back down the Blackfoot on a dog day in August, I like to point my toes downstream and look up to cliffs and clouds. A red-tailed hawk sails above me. I float past silver-plumed willows. Blue dragonflies hover above a riffle. A kingfisher with his crested outsized head dives for a minnow. Immersed in liquid light, I find relief from self and time. Each of us has memories we sing over and over again, like a song in our inner ears. If your place of memory and connection is the big Blackfoot River, you are blessed as I am. You will want to do what you can to save the river so your gen grandchildren can float its green waters and fish its native cutthroats and bull trout. You will re teach them to dive into deep pools, touch stones that go back to the beginning of time. Well, now that I'm here with a bunch of old people, there's something that has bothered me for years. And you have all heard of uh, Thomas Francis Meager, <coughs> Mark, right. and Pondera County, Pondera. Okay, uh, Judy, you said service berries. When I was a kid, and my dad was a, was an old timer, and my grand and my grandparents, and so on, they would talk about service berries. Mm -hmm. right. 
Well, what, how, I, now I hear young people saying service varies. So we're not going to correct them and tell them that it's spelled service, but it's actually pronounced service, or we just... I stand corrected, Doug. We made a pact among ourselves, the readers, because we're all like kind of nervous. So if there's a word that we stumble over, we're just going to kind of go by it as fast as we can and hope that nobody notices. But thank you for catching that. <laughs> You know, have, have we changed it or? <laughs> well, Bob just calls it Amalike or California. What? We avoid that. <laughs> this little reading is one of the other stories in Norman McLean's a 1976 novella, A River Runs Through It, and other stories. This selection was based on a summer's spent working in Anaconda Company logging camps in the Blackfoot in 1927 and 28. These were the first years that Anaconda had come back to the Blackfoot after spending 10 years in the Nine Mile Valley. The, ra the, other, the other stories were The Ranger, The Cook, The Hole in the Sky was made into a television movie starring Sam Elliott in 1995, three years after Robert Redford's A River Run Suet came out in this, in this selection. McLean introduces readers to the grit, grime, and tensions in a lumberjack living together in a logging camp. Logging and pimping and your pal Jim. The first time I took a real notice of him was on a Sunday afternoon in a bunkhouse in one of Anaconda Company's logging camps on the Blackfoot River. He and I and some others had been lying on our bunks reading. Although it was warm and half dark in the bunkhouse this summer afternoon, the rest of them had been talking. But to me, everything seemed to be quiet as the events proved in a few minutes. The talking had been about the company. Probably the reason I hadn't heard it was that the lumberjacks were registering their customary complaints about the company. It owned them, body and soul. It owned the state of Montana, the press, the preachers, etc. The grub was lousy, and likewise the wages, which the company took right back from them anyway by overpricing everything at the commissary. They had to buy from the commissary. Out in the woods, where else could they buy it? It must have been something like this they were saying because all of a sudden I heard him break the quiet. Shut up, you incompetent SOBs. If it weren't for the company, you'd all starve to death. At first, I wasn't sure I'd heard it or that he had said it, but he had, everything was really quiet. Now everybody was watching his small face, his big head and body behind an elbow on his bunk. After a while there were stirrings and one by one the stirrings disappeared into the sunlight of the door. Not stirring, not a stirring spoke as this was a logging camp and they were big men. Lying there in my bunk, I realized that actually this was not the first time I had noticed him. For instance, I already knew his name which was Jim Grierson, and I knew he was a socialist who thought Eugene Debs was soft. Probably he hated the company more than any man in camp, but the men he hated more than the company. It was also clear I hadn't noticed him before, because when I started to wonder how I, I would come out with him in a fight, I discovered I already had the answer. I estimate he weighed 185 to 190 pounds, he was at least 30 pounds heavier than I was, but I figured I had been better taught and I could reduce him to size if I could last the first 10 minutes. I also figured that probably I couldn't last the first 10 minutes. <laughs> I didn't go back to my reading but lay there looking for something interesting to think about and was in interested in finally realizing that I had estimated my chances with Jim in a fight even before I thought I had noticed him. Almost from the first moment I saw Jim, I must have felt threatened. And the others obviously felt the same way. Later as I come to know him all the better, 
my thinking about him was colored by the question, him or me? He had just taken over the bunkhouse except for me. Now he was tossing on his bunk to indicate his discomfort with my presence. I stuck it out for a while just to establish homestead rights to existence. But now that I couldn't read anymore, the bunkhouse seemed hotter than ever. After carefully measuring my implications of not being wanted, I got up and sauntered out the door as he rolled over and sighed. By the end of summer, which I had to go back to school, I knew a lot more about Jim. In fact, he and I made a deal to be partners for the coming summer. It didn't take long to find out that he was the best lumberjack in camp. He was probably the best with a saw and an ax, and he worked with the kind of speed that was part ferocity. This was back in 1927, as I remember. Of course, there was no such thing as chainsaws then. Just as now, there's no such thing as logging camp or bunkhouse the whole length of the Blackfoot River. Although there's still a lot of logging going on there, now saws are one-man chainsaws with a light, high-speed motors. And the sawyers are all married. They live with their families, some of them as far away as Missoula, and drive more than 100 miles a day to get to and from work. But in the days of the logging camps, the men worked mostly on two-man cross-cut saws that were things of beauty. And the highest paid man in camp was the man who delicately filed, filed them and set them. The two-man teams who pulled the saw either worked for wages or jippoed. To jippo wasn't meant to be a nice sounding term and could be used as either a noun or a verb was to be paid by the number of thousands of board feet you cut each day. Naturally, you chose to go dipple only if you thought you could beat wages, uh, beat the wages, and the men who work for wages. As I said, Jim talked me into being his partner for the rest of the summer, and we were going to dipple and make big money. You can bet I agreed to this with some misgivings, but as I was in graduate school now and from on my own, Financially, the need to have big money besides, I suppose I was threatened or flatter, flattered by being asked to be a partner in camp. It was a long way, though, from being all flattery. I also knew I was being challenged. This is a world of the woods and the working stiff, the logging camp being a world especially overbearing with challenges. And if you expected to duck all those challenges, you shouldn't have wandered into the woods in the first place. It is true, too, that up to a point, I liked being around him. He was three years older than I was, which at times is a lot. But he had seen parts of life which I, as a son of a Presbyterian mentor, wasn't intimate with. Now I got elected to do two in a row. <laughs> this other little is uh, When the Drive Comes Down. It's an anonymous logging ballad from The Baron, The Logger, The Miner, and Me by John Toole. It's unintroduced. Toole inserted a short version of this logging ballad into a chapter that would about a log drive from Seeley Lake in the spring of 1907. Arthur Murray Chisholm, in his 1911 novel, The Boss of Wind River, right, refers to When the Drive Comes Down as an ancient logging ballad. During the winter, the logs were piled high along the banks uh, of the river on skidways that were called rollaways, where they would deck mountains of logs. And then come spring when the water came up, they would break these rollaways down, uh, sometimes with an uh, axe or whatever leverage they had, and many a time, some of the had breaking rollaways down, uh, the loggers would either be injured or killed. I mean, the mountains of logs would be decked probably 30 feet high and held up there by a couple of logs to support them. When they broke them loose, you had 
get out of the way. Uh, Henry Prost, a person who grew up in the Nine Mile Prairie, said some of the rollaways, the easiest way to get them out was they dynamited them loose. It saved a lot of loggers' lives. When the drive comes down. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh now they're going to make sure I'm reading it right. <laughs> Come all ye gallant shanty boys and listen while I sing. We've worked six months in the cruel forest, but soon we'll take our fling. The ice is black and rotten, and the rollaway is piled high. So boost upon your PV sticks while I tell you why. For it's break the rollaways out, my boys, and let the big sticks slide. And file your corks and grease your boots and start upon the drive. A hundred miles of water is the nearest way to town, so tie into the tailor and keep her hustling down. There's, a, oh, there's some poor lads will never lift a peavy hook again, nor hear the trees crack with frost or feel the warm spring rain. It was falling timber, rolling logs that handed them their time. It was their luck to get it so, it may be yours, it may be mine. But break the rollaways out, my lads, and let the big stick slide. For one man killed within the woods, ten drowned upon the drive. So make your peace before you take the nearest way to town, while lads that are in heaven watch the drive go down. I'm next, okay. <laughs> I lost my voice. <laughs> Sorry, he's taking a nap. Look at him, no, it's fine to talk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a thing on it. Uh, Get to the mic. Okay, this poet is named, boy, this is a weird name, Paul Zarziski. He was born and raised in a logging town in Hurley, Wisconsin. Moved to Missoula, Montana, where he earned a master's degree in fine arts, a degree in creative writing. He had a love of cowboy poetry, which is obvious as he blends lumberjack and cowboy skills into this poetry. I'll take a, I'll take a moment to talk about a book that a friend of mine and his wife were going to write. It, 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 it describes, it will describe, if we ever put it together, the late 50s, early 60s. And I would like to call that shoebox forts, drive in movies, fogged up windows. What was that again? <laughs> You're going to slap me alongside the head? Okay, let me get back to Paul in here. <laughs> It's called a graveyard shift at Bonner Mill. Pitch glistens on the pine like sweat, and the white logs roll slow. Cattle that sense the butcher, the odor of fresh cut bone. A quarter moon sinks a keen edge into a clear cut mountain, and only the stars or sawdust your cross cut sprays against the dark. The one hope, the neon at Harold's Milltown Bar. Hugo's poems preserved there forever under glass, like the bighorn and the billy. These hours fester in your head. Too much caffeine, tobacco juice, the peavies that stab your flesh in bad dreams you have all day. This work is meant for bitter nights when the Blackfoot floats our shadow far downstream and a nighthawk is the only witness. So, for me, that is just one good blend of cowboys and lumberjacks. Okay, that's my deal for Paul. You're not going to throw anything at me? <laughs> well, still, I'm going to make an airplane. <laughs> This is about Michael Moon. 
and he uh, wrote John Medicine Wolf. Uh, he was born here in Missoula and grew up and he John Moon passed or Michael Moon passed away of died of cancer in 1986 and by the way his father was the state forester from Montana this is uh, taken in from two different excerpts the first one sawmill one and sawmill two it begins with a reference in sawmill two right here and uh, it uh, tells about John Medicine Wolf's current job described as a newspaper delivery route on a newspaper delivery route from Missoula to Salmon Idaho before I had the salmon run I worked in the sawmill over at Milltown. It was a modern industrial plant housing many saws. As Turkey Track says, they even have smokestacks that have stopped smoking. This was in reference to the pollution control equipment. He goes on to say he worked for a while in a cutout plant at the sawmill, but most of the story has to do with an older co-worker who befriends him and tells him stories from the neighborhood of Porcupine Creek and Matthewburg, maybe East Missoula. And they figured that Porcupine Creek is over here at Deer Creek. Both of one and two is from the sawmill uh, sections and this one is taken from sawmill two. Eventually, I ended up, ended up in another part of the plant, running a machine called an edger. It trimmed the sides of the newly created boards so they would all be the same width. It looked sort of like a modern sized printing press, the old kind with many rollers and gears, and you would feed the boards into one end of the machine and they would come out all nicely trimmed at the other. The machine itself ate the edgings and thus derived its nourishment. The only thing hard about the job was that you had to do it very fast to keep up with the machine. Keeping up with the machine is a concept which forms the basic building block in all sawmill design. One day the plant safety man decided he didn't like me. It was right after I got married and I think he didn't like me because I was so happy. So he started to harass me. First he told me that I had to wear my tin hat forward. I always wore it backwards because then the funny little bill that sticks out front of the hat is not, is not in the way. And you can see better and it's not so dangerous. But he insisted so I ended up doing it the dangerous way. Then he decided I should get a leather apron because I was handling lumber. The lumber never touched me the whole time I was running the edger, but he thought I should have an apron anyway. Safety rules, he said. So finally I bought an apron, which cost $17. Wearing an apron was more dangerous because it could get caught in the machinery, but he insisted, so I ended up doing it the dangerous way. So now I wore my hat frontwards, had an apron, safety first. Even though I did not need an apron, I finally decided that if something did ever happen to me, it would get me from behind, because I wouldn't see it coming. So I put the apron on backwards. It was also safer that way because it wouldn't get caught in the machinery. When the safety man saw that, he became enraged. I don't know what was wrong, but his face turned red, blood veins stood out on his forehead, and he yelled and yelled. He said I was making fun of him. 
I had been wearing my hat backwards, and now I was wearing the apron backwards. So I was a smart ass, and worst of all, the worst of all, I was being unsafe on purpose. A short time after he left, the guy from the International Brotherhood, a sawmill worker's local 1028, came down from the catwalk that hangs above the edgers and told me that I got fired. There would, if I got fired, there would be nothing he could do for me. After all, safety rules were safety rules. They were in the contract. I smiled and shook his hand and told him that there probably wouldn't be nothing I could do for him either. About that time, Jack Nelson retired. He had worked at the sawmill 39 years. The company let us take 15 minutes off to sort of say goodbye. 15 minutes. We had coffee and donuts over in the maintenance office and all the electricians, pipe fitters, machinists, and millwrights were there. Jack Nelson had been a machinist. We presented him with a new wallet. Inside was all the money we had chipped in. Mary Jo, the secretary, asked him where he wanted to meet so they could spend the money. Everybody chuckled good naturedly. One of the millwrights told him he'd go crazy being retired sitting around doing nothing. He replied, who said anything about sitting around? And he leered at Mary Jo. Everybody chuckled good naturedly. His last official day had been the day before, so his coveralls were at home. He wandered around the mill all day, watching people work and looking strange without his overhauls on. He went and cleaned up his shop polished and put away all the company tools, got his radio so he wasn't going to do any work and if he got tired that he'd sit down and rest. Everybody chuckled good-naturedly. I saw him leaving hours after quitting time. Someone on swing shift was welding inside the pump house. You could see the blue electric arc and hear the hammering. He stood for a long time and listened. I saw him walk out the front gate, turning down the street toward home and leaving 39 years behind, pushing up against the wind, pushing his collar up against the wind. His hands looked cold. I suppose his gloves were in his coveralls. I watched him shuffle on down the street, carrying his radio under his arm. <laughs> that summer came and is gone and everything we predicted happened including the death of the fishermen we didn't mention that before but we knew and we don't lie to look good. We didn't foresee the sun would never return. This brings us to us and our set lines set deep on the bottom. We're going all out for the big ones. A new technology keeps the water level steady year round. The company dam is self-cleaning. In this dreamy summer air, you and I dreamily plan a statue commemorating the unknown fisherman. The stone will bear no inscription and that deliberate anonymity will start enough rumors to keep the mill operating, big trout nosing the surface, the church reforming white frame into handsome blue stone, and this community going strong another hundred years. Thanks for coming. It's pasty time. Don't forget Tuesday night if you can make it. Tuesday night at the bar, 7 o'clock.